Hi, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org here with SiliconANGLE TV's live continuous coverage from the Moscone Center in San Francisco, California. And joining me for this segment is Scott Lowe. Scott's other Scott Lowe on Twitter. I he am. is an author. He is uh, the founder and managing contributor of the 1610 Group, and he's also a contributor of the Wikibon community. So, Scott, first time on the Cube. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Stu. Great. So, you know, what we try to do on the Cube here is we, we find the, the you know the smartest people we can find out there, I and mean, we try to extract the signal from the noise and share with the community what's going on. And, and, and you're one of those great community sharers. As I said, you know, you, you you've written for uh, it was like you know CBS Multimedia, uh, the, kind of the ZDNet stuff. Um, you, you, you're working with us at Wikibon, um, you've written a couple of books, um, and uh, really from an expertise standpoint, some of the things we're going to talk about today is, is Microsoft. Yes, we're here at VMware's show, but we're going to talk a little bit about Microsoft. Um, Flash, VDI, and some of the other kind of transformations going on here. So, so first of all, um, you know, have you been to VMworld before? I have. This is actually only my second VMworld, but it's a great show. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much here. And it's bigger than the last one I was at, very yeah. by, by far. So, and, and this year you, you were actually named a VMware vExpert? For the so, first time, yes. So congratulations, but you've been a Microsoft MVP for how many years? I have actually never been an MVP. Oh, really? I have not. Okay, so the, just that you've written a bunch of books, they... Uh, That's okay. This. So, if we look at the, kind of the discussion of VMware, one of the underlying kind of back discussions is, you know, VMware dominates in the hypervisor market today. But we've been talking for the last couple of years is, is Microsoft closing the gap? Is it good enough? Does the ecosystem need to partner with more than one? And you know, we just had HP on, and HP is hypervisor agnostic. We're going yeah. to do um, you know, multiple hypervisors. Um, you, know, you go to some of the Microsoft shows like TechEd and everything. Um, you've been doing some writing on kind of the latest of uh, Hyper-V. So you know, where is Microsoft in the hypervisor market? What, what's your lay of the land for VMware and Microsoft? Yeah, as I look at where we are today and where we're, where we're headed, I see Microsoft as very much um, a force to be reckoned with and something that VMware is going to have to make sure that they're able to, to counter in some effective way. In fact, um, I, I wrote an article recently for Wikibon and have some stats that show that of the respondents that responded to a survey by Wikibon, um, we had 57% of the respondents were running more than one hypervisor. Right. All of them were running VMware, but another 57%, or a majority of them, were actually running a second hypervisor. And the, the hypervisor that was in the lead in the secondary spot was Hyper-V. Um, as we see with Hyper-V 2012 coming out, uh, from a feature by feature perspective, it significantly closes the gap with vSphere. So we're gonna, I think we're going to see um, a lot of competition from Microsoft. The war of marketing, the war of words is already escalating. There's a lot of marketing collateral being released, and there's a lot of testing going on. Of course, Hyper-V has not actually GA'd yet. Um, Hyper-V3, so you're Hyper saying. Hyper-V3 has not yes. actually GA'd yet. So the, the proof is in the pudding. We'll see what happens once the GA's and what kind of uptake it gets. But there's a lot of interest um, out there about, yeah. so, about Hyper-V. So Scott, I want to poke for a second at uh, you know, what we call kind of the multi-hypervisor environment. So you've been a CIO before. I have. And, and what you tend to give from a viewpoint is what should CIOs do. Yes. The discussion point we've had in data centers for a while now is the difference between kind of like the pure cloud environments like you know, the, the Googles and the Facebooks is they only have a couple of applications and they have a homogeneous environment. Right. And the mess of the enterprise is because we have silos and multiple vendors and everything else like that. So, you know, should customers standardize on a single hypervisor? You know, why are they doing multi-hypervisors? Is it a good or a bad idea in your opinion? It really depends on the situation. If you're looking at a large enterprise where you're going to have environments that can't be well supported by Hyper-V, uh, they're obviously going to be running VMware. They may run Hyper-V in some test beds. You may see developers running Hyper-V, particularly once we see the next wave of Windows hit, because you're going to see Hyper-V built into the client now. Um, I think that's going to help push Hyper-V a little bit as a secondary uh, hypervisor for many organizations. Um, and it may help drive it into the enterprise a little bit. But those larger organizations are running workloads that might not necessarily translate well to, to Hyper-V. So they're running VMware because it's a much, much broader platform um, from a support perspective than, than Hyper-V is currently. Whether that's good or bad <clears throat> really depends on um, if it's able to be supported. Um, if the organization's meeting its business goals, great. Um, pick the solution that, that makes the most sense uh, from that perspective. Not you know, it's a, it really depends on the dollars and cents and the, the solution that's going to work. So a lot of it does come down to the, the dollars and cents. Uh, if, if we look at 
kind of the open source environment, you know, it, it's kind of free hypervisors. Um, many people have said really the, the hypervisor is commoditized today. Um, you, you've looked really closely at Hyper-V. Um, is there a lo lot of air gap between, you know, kind of a, a standard, kind of the essentials plus VMware versus Hyper-V, or has, has Microsoft closed the gap? With Hyper-V 3, Microsoft has closed the gap in a, lot, in a number of significant ways. From a scalability perspective, it rivals VMware at this point. So when you talk about that monster VM, Hyper-V can support the monster VM these days. Wow. Um, when you look at some of the enterprise grade features that are necessary in a hypervisor, um, particularly no downtime live migrations and things like that, whereas Microsoft did not generally have an answer for that in the past, with Hyper-V 3, those issues go away. In fact, they've been um, really trying to push the envelope on some of, some of those features uh, in the re with the re recent release of Hyper, or the recent, the coming release of Hyper-V, I'm sorry. Um, and you're going to see some of these things like shared nothing live migration, like what was introduced in vSphere 5.1 yest yeah. uh, yesterday. Um, so we're starting to see, um, I think the competition is good for both VMware and Microsoft, and ultimately good for the customer. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's great commentary, Scott, because, uh, you know, vMotion has been, uh, you know, for the last decade, really that kind of kind of secret sauce. Uh, you know, kind of the premium functionality that they do, uh, that they kind of, uh, you know, pull customers in for. So um, that's, that's interesting, you know, so should VMware be scared uh, of Microsoft? What have you heard at the show here? Is this a response to Microsoft? What they're doing? Are they still kind of the dominant lead dog? Or are you seeing things from, like, the, the, the elimination of the VRAM or VTAX? Uh, that, is that a response to Microsoft and kind of the threat that they see from below? I do believe that's actually a response to Microsoft. Um, you know, obviously it was introduced last year, it was incredibly unpopular. I think it was, a, I think it was frankly qu quite a mistake um, based on earlier guidance that customers had gotten from, v from VMware. Um, and it was uh, also a marketing tool that Microsoft could bludgeon VMware to death with. Um, they've effectively eliminated a, a, a marketing tool for Microsoft, and that's good for VMware. Um, but if you look at the, the, from a direct cost perspective, Hyper-V is still a free hypervisor and it has all of the enterprise features that you're going to find in even an enterprise plus SKU these days from VMware, including a distri uh, virtual distributed switch, uh, all, of, all the live migration features, the high availability features. Um, now, they're not quite as smooth as they are in, v, uh, in vSphere, um, but they are there. And I think that you're going to see a lot of CIOs start to say, what am I paying for when I can just have something maybe not quite as smooth, but that still does what I need to be able, what I need to, be able to do to get business done. Wow. Great, so uh, fascinating stuff. Look forward to more writing from you on, on kind of the Microsoft piece. I'd like to transition a little over to the end user computing or VDI space. Sure. So uh, while in the hypervisor, all the discussion is usually about VMware uh, you know, versus Microsoft and VDI, it, it's Citrix has you know, been yeah. the lead dog there. Uh, certain advanced functionality that Citrix has had. In many ways, VMware has closed the gap um, and Microsoft has partnered with Citrix uh, for, mm -hmm. for, for a lot of these solutions. So um, what's your take on VDI? Did you happen to catch the, the keynote this morning? Uh, you know, how's VMware doing and, and what do you see in, in the VDI marketplace? Well, and, you know, VDI has been one of these, uh, it's almost a unicorn in some, in some respects. They get the perfect VDI solution. You know, as a, as a former CIO, when I first started looking at VDI, I was looking at it very much from a cost perspective. I wanted, this, I wanted to figure out a way to get out of the endless desktop replacement life cycle that we were always in, every five years replacing PCs just to replace them. But with VDI, we were able to start thinking about leaving those endpoints out there and redirecting our funds into, into really making the core um, a great place to be, and then basically just having endpoints, kind of return to the mainframe days. But as time's gone on, the economics have not necessarily uh, worked out for all, for, if you're not trying to do VDI to save money, you're doing it wrong, basically. Um, up until recently, at least. Yeah, you know, one of the things in the keynote that got a good chuckle, especially across the Twitterverse, is um, one of the ways that you can lower the cost of VDI is through BYOD, bring yes. your own desktop, or as VMware put out, it's uh, S-Y-O-M, spend your own money. <laughs> exactly. So we joked all of us that kind of, you know, love using Macintoshes and tablets and everything, you know, I, I bought my own iPad, you know, it, it's, it's supported by, you know, Wikibon, but, you know, that was my own dollars to be able to get that client, so. I see BYOD and VDI as, as, as interlinked. Yeah. Um, I think that's what will actually drive VDI more than anything. It won't be the necessary, the, the cost savings that come with it from the enterprise as the primary driver, but it'll be to satisfy those BYOD wishes that we're seeing rise these days, because IT can still deploy and provision a standard desktop, so no matter what the device. And that's what really we want to see in IT, is as much standardization as we can to make things easy to support, make it easy to train users, keep our costs down so that things are a bit repeatable. 
Yeah. Uh, is there anything from the Microsoft side about VDI that, that, that's coming out in that new release that we should know about? We're going to see a lot of remote FX enhancements. That's Microsoft's answer to um, Teradici's PCOIP. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I haven't uh, researched enough yet to, to be able to tell you exactly what other VDI enhancements are coming, but they are coming. I know that they've done a lot with remote FX. They're putting their, they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is on making remote effects a, a, a first-rate protocol. All right. So, so uh, the, the last topic I think we want to cover is Flash. So, uh, you know, kind of joke, you know, in the storage industry, you know, Flash is the savior of the universe. Uh, you yeah. know, the, the old classic Queen song. So, uh, you know, you've looked a lot at Flash. Uh, it, it's one of these uh, discussion points that when you talk about refresh cycles, um, our CIO is saying, is this something that I just kind of add to my existing environment, or do I go a brand new architecture? Do I have a specific application for Fusion I.O. or, you know, violin, or am I looking at some of these new hybrid or all flash arrays. Um, you did a, a, what we, I believe it's called the CIO primer on uh, solid state storage uh, up on the Wikibon site. Free research that you can go uh, find if you just, you know, Google, you know, Wikibon pri CIO primer solid state storage, you'll find it easier. Go to wikibon.org. So, you know, what did you find in this study and, and what's your advice for CIOs looking at flash? You know, one of the things that I want to mention something I saw here at the show as regard to flash, the, the storage market is represented well here at VMworld. I mean, I believe that every other booth is potentially a storage player um, at, this, at this show, which tells you that, that basically virtualization and, and storage are inextricably linked to one another. But what we're seeing in the flash market is a lot of players taking, taking advantage of the, of, the, of the revolution that's coming in storage. From a CIO perspective, I, the, when you look at what's next, again, it's going to depend on workload. If you're a big data place, you're going to look at a peer or you're going to look at a whiptail where you're going to be doing something all, all SSD where you really got to have those massive IOPS in order to be able to support your research efforts. But if you're looking as a general company that just needs to do day-to-day -day work, I believe the hybrid plays are really going to be a sweet spot for many CIOs. They have the advantage of having high IOPS for those workloads that uh, require it, but also being able to have high capacity to be able to store the data that's necessary from a capacity perspective in, uh, in organizations. Yeah, so, so, you know, Flash, I mean, is a technology, but how do companies approach this? You know, is it the line of business that says, I, ha I have this research application that I can't meet what I need? You know, how does it kind of come into the environment organizationally? You know, where do you see it fitting and it kind of playing out? Um, if, if an organization is run appropriately, it's going to be a partnership between the business and IT to determine what is necessary. The business is going to tell IT, here's what we require, and somebody's going to research that project and figure out what's necessary. Um, and I see basically the, the business demanding particular applications and then IT saying, okay, we can, we can meet that need. We're going to need to deploy either an all flash or a, a hybrid flash array in order to meet the performance requirements that you have for that particular application. Obviously, there's also the cloud that comes into that. There may be a cloud provider that can provide those services instead. Um, but it really, it really needs to be um, thought through well to ensure that the, the, the ultimate outcomes are met from a business perspective. Okay, so uh, you know, can't end without talking about you know the next big you know data dis disruption um, that you know a lot of CIOs are going to need to be think about, which is big data. So obviously, Wikibon uh, done a lot in the big data space. Um, you know, you've come more uh, usually writing about the infrastructure side. You know, Wikibon.org/slash/big data is where we've got kind of most of our research. So you know, for infrastructure folks, kind of like you and me, for, with our background, you know, wh what does big data mean to you and, and how should CIOs and companies be looking at it in your mind? You know, if I put on my infrastructure hat, I look at big data as, as a um, speed and feed sort of thing. I got to make sure that I'm provisioning the storage that can meet the, the, the massive IOPS that are going to be necessary in order to support these huge data sets, that, uh, crunching these huge data sets, the compute load and the IOPS load. And I've got to make sure that I'm building solutions that will also um, meet the capacity requirements. And obviously we're seeing some other players actually join this space to help in that effort. Companies like Cloud Physics um, are helping make sure that, we that we're sizing our applications appropriately um, to meet the workload needs in our environment. Um, so I've, as a, from a CIO perspective, those are the kind of places I'd be turning to these days to help me size um, my environment appropriately for the coming wave of big data applications. Yeah, I mean, Scott, you mentioned cloud physics. You know, one of the things I love coming to VMworld is there's so many startups. So cloud physics just came out of stealth. Uh, I managed to go to an event last night. They had, you know, Mendel, the guy who, you know, created VMware there. So uh, it, it was phenomenal to see some of the startups and brilliant people here. Um, you've been walking around the show. Uh, any, any kind of cool technologies are interesting? You know, what's on your follow-up research list that you see? I saw this 
this and I really want to dig into it after, you know, either technology or you know, any cool companies you've seen? One of my goals is to continue to expand and um, scale the flash primer. Yep. So I've actually been visiting with a lot of the flash companies to learn more about them to, so I can make that resource um, as valuable as possible for the Wikibon community. Um, so that's actually where I put a lot of my focus is um, is on the on the storage vendors. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah yesterday we actually had you know quite a lot of them on. From uh, we had a new startup called Proximal Data was on early in the morning. Uh, software based solution Fusion IO was on and had two panels, one of hybrids and one of all flash. So we'll, we'll probably make sure you got those videos linked in uh, the the article that you Absolutely. posted. So uh, Scott, I'll just uh, any other finding final comments that you want to add to kind of your your VM world experience, uh, you know here. Uh, it's been a great show. Um, I was. I'll tell you, I was thrilled to hear the end of, the, of, of VRAM yesterday. I think that the applause was all it was, um, all it was necessary. I think VMware's um, taking the right steps to counter the, the coming Microsoft threat, and it's obvious that we're moving beyond the data center. Um, in a lot of different ways, and this show is proof of that just by walking around the trade show floor. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so, so Scott, thank you for sharing your, uh, your your CIO viewpoint to the user community out here. Uh, absolutely some you know critical things that CIOs in all companies need to look at. You know, VMware's got an impressive ecosystem, but you know, Microsoft's right on their heels. Um, you want to make sure that you know, the advancements and the vision isn't you know, kind of overrun by things like licensing and pricing and all these other things which are gonna, just going to drive, drive uh, customers away. So uh, you can find Scott at Other Scott Low on Twitter. Uh, you can also find a lot of his writing on wikibon.org. Any other, uh, where, whatever else should we go? I believe you've got your own website that we should. I do. At. I have an uh, aggregate website of all my writing at uh, cioscape.com. Um, and uh, my business website is at 1610group.com. All right. So Scott, thank you so much for joining us. This Thanks, is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org and we'll be right back with our next guest here at VMworld 2012.